exposed. Uh, I'm a past president of the Newcomer Society and uh, tre kind of treasurer for a few more months at any rate. And as treasurer, I would like to see all those books disappear by the end of the day. Uh, and end of the day. It's my great pleasure to introduce Julia Elton, who's also a past president of the Newcomer Society, is current secretary of Newcomer Society, and is just completing her PhD thesis of various aspects of 18th century in the early 19th and 10th century lighthouse services. Uh, but today she's going to talk the Maudsley and Sun and Field and Unknown Suspension Julia. Well, I know this is hardly precision engineering. On the other hand, this has to be the best audience to unveil this thing to. As many of you will know, and I suppose some of you will really know at the end of January, when I'm not running around writing about lighthouse reflectors, I'm rewriting the history of the Clifton Suspension Bridge, about which unspeakable twaddle has been said, <laughs> all dating back to Isambard Renault Jr.'s intensely ghastly and mendacious biography of his son published in 1870, from which everybody has taken their story about the Clifton Suspension Bridge, which is wrong. So, I'm a Bristolian, etc. So, I've been going back to the original archives in the Bristol Record Office and at the Brunel Institute in Bristol. And as I'm sure you will know, on the 1st of October, 1829, there was an advertisement asking for designs for a proposed bridge over the Avon Gorge at Clifton in Bristol. And people put in their designs, and they, of course, with those designs, they had to submit a statement. So what I was astonished about is I'm reading I.K. Brunel's statement for the 1829 competition describing one of his multitudinous designs. He didn't have any else to do in those days. So he writes, according to the present mode of connecting the links, upwards of one quarter of the whole weight of the chains is employed in the connections, increasing the load without adding to the strength. I propose adopting an improvement lately introduced by Messrs. Maudsley and Field in a bridge constructed by them for the island of Ceylon, by which the short connecting links are dispensed with, the total width diminished considerably, and the number of joints reduced to half. And I'm thinking, really? I don't associate the name Maudsley with suspension, which is personally. So that's the 1829 competition. You'll hear more details of some of all this in January if you come. There's another set of shortlists in December 1830. And so Brunel says again in the new report, in the new statement, in the Menai Bridge, the excess of metal in the connections forms upwards of 30% of the whole weight of the chain. Or in other words, there is not quite 70% of the chain really effective, the remaining 30% being an encumbrance. The simplification here proposed, and which has, has already been carried into effect by Messrs. Maudsley and Field in a bridge erected by them for the government of the Isle of Ceylon, the effective portion will be upwards of 85%. How well, this is what Brunel is actually talking about. This is, there is there a pointer on this thing? There is. Here, this is Samuel Brown to the Bridge of 1820. A chain, a chain, they're united with these connecting plates. That's the Menai Bridge. So, the, you know, and again, there are the connecting plates joining up the that's joining up the chains. In 1853, this is the Portland Bridge in, in Glasgow, and although it's slightly chronologically out of sequence, 
the point about it is that, in fact, it's got connecting plates, as you can see. And you can see, I think, quite graphically, how much metal goes into, into these connecting plates, <coughs> each of these chains, you know. I mean, so you can see. And the really <coughs> interesting thing is that actually, and the really wonderful thing, the wonderful thing about having been an antiquarian book dealer is you've no idea of the amount of books on civil structural mechanical engineering, not only have I handled, I've actually read them. And back in the early 70s, I had a book by somebody called Bingham called Public Works of Salon. And I thought, oh, I've only ever heard it once. It's incredibly rare. So I went scuttling to the British Library, and I found the details of it. And in the meantime, Martin Beaumont, who was my absolutely fabulous research assistant, if I could say so, ran all over the internet for me, and he found this photograph of the Canadian Centre of Architecture. There is the Gampola Bridge Salon, 205 foot span, shipped out in 1829. The history of this thing was written in 1926, the public works of, of, of Salon. What's really interesting is that in 1829, when it got shipped out, it got dumped in a warehouse and it got lost and nobody recognized it for what it was until Sir Henry Ward, the governor of Ceylon, who was in, in this period, in the 1850s and 60s, is actually looking at the infrastructure of the island. And he writes, um, he finds the bridge, he finds it in bits in a warehouse. And he says, it is strange that the means of accomplishing this improvement, i.e. the bridge, should have been in the colony for more than 30 years without any proposal being made for taking advantage. Indeed, I believe that the bridge, though nearly perfect in all its parts, had been altogether forgotten in the commissariat stores until I caused it to be put together and ascertained that out of the whole mass of iron sent out in 1829, only two links were wanting, which were easily supplied from India. Well, basically, the whole point about this is the chains. And instead of having connecting pieces, they are joined together, as I.K. Brunel proposed <coughs> for Clifton in 1829. And I've done all this in a completely wrong order. I did this in a terrible hurry and I've forgotten where my chains are. We'll get to them eventually. Anyway, so there is the Maudsley Bridge. You can just about see, I hope, that these chains don't have any connecting plates. They are they have both connecting the two bits of eye. That, in fact, is the picture that I discovered in the book by Bingham. And again, I think you can see quite easily how these change. It's a very economic and very elegant way of doing it. Well, I rather like, if you look at those rather elegant piers, it seems to me that there's a sort of family resemblance, if I can put it. That is the roof of Maudsley Works. It actually collapsed in 1826. But nevertheless, somebody, I assume it's Maudsley, but perhaps it's Field, I haven't done much <coughs> more research on this, so I'm waiting for somebody to inspire me and tell me what they think. But somebody clearly was good at structural ironwork, not just ironwork for mechanical engineering. There it is. Again, the end view. And I mean, you can see Sir Humphrey Ward, Henry Ward, 
thinks it's very beautiful, and I hope you think it's very beautiful too, because I think it's, you know, elegant. It's slightly, I would think, based a little bit maybe on the Menai Bridge, which has got these arched um, approaches. And basically, it is totally unknown and unrecorded. It's not a Dracula. I've been all over the internet. I think you would have to know about your own know, public works of Salon combined with reading Brunel's impossible handwriting. But it seems to me that it's an incredibly unusual commission for this firm. I mean, did they make any, any other suspension bridges? 1829, there have only been about five, what I call big bridges. So well over, this is 205 foot span. There are lots of teensy weensy bridges in Scotland and all over the place that make 30, 40, 50 foot span. But the period of big suspension bridges only begins in 1820 with Samuel Bryant Unigan Bridge, and that is about 400 foot span. Then there is, of course, Menai, which has got a potential span of 580 feet, and there are three or four more of 200 feet plus. So this is the first generation of big suspension bridges, even if it wasn't built in 1829. And of course, the timing is interesting because Brunel responds to the advertisement on the 1st of October, 1829, and he must have seen this bridge in the Maudsley Works before it got shipped out. And then, of course, you know, he knew about block making, and of course, the Maudsley's built, but built the, one of the two tunneling shields for the Thames Tunnel, so Henry Maudsley and the Brunels are clearly, they know each other very well. So, he built the chains for the Clifton Suspension Bridge, he got the job. But, as you all know, there was never enough money, it all went belly up. And in 1853, those chains got sold to the Cornwall Railway Company for use on the Saltash Bridge. And again, you can see them quite nicely there in the photograph illustrating Humber's book on bridges. So it's surely the first bridge, the Maudsley Bridge, is the first bridge actually built with these overlapping links. I then started to think, well, if Clifton wasn't actually built in 1831, which of course, as you all know, it wasn't, who then actually uses the first ever built suspension bridge with these overlapping links? And I think one has to conclude that it is I.K. Brunel on Hungerford because Hungerford, which was a pedestrian, which has got many elements that are similar to his Clifton Bridge designs, and why wouldn't he use these chains, which he's clearly very, thinks of a picture of wonderful idea, as you could hear from those first two passages. And the second time that they were used, I'm pretty sure, is William Henry Clark's Sir Cheney Bridge in Budapest. Then there is Clifton, which finally, after 1864, gets built. Of course, this is my great theme, and Martin will totally go along with me, won't you, Martin? That although they used second-hand components for the Clifton Bridge when it was built, they took them from the Hungerford Bridge, and as you will all know, you will shortly know, of course, the bridge is built, was not built by I.K. Brunel, but was built by Barlow and Hawkshaw, but using this Brunel's chains off the Hungerford Bridge, and as you can see, it, they are very beautiful, very elegant, very economic, and I mean, lovely to look at. Then, whatever the links of this and Brunel says in 1875, these links were used universally by everybody. Actually, they weren't. A, the Portland Bridge I showed you is 1853, but actually there weren't all that many big suspension bridges built using flat wall iron chains after 1864, because after that everybody became sensible and used cables, which is what the French had been using, except, interestingly, Joseph Bazalchet on, new, on the new bridge, Hounsmith Bridge of 18, whenever I said it was, open 1887. This is incredibly old-fashioned by 1887. And I think it's the last one that was built. 
So basically, I think where I'm going with this, I'm going to leave you with the Gampola Bridge. I think that this is the first time, and somebody in Maudsley's understood all this, and you will, I'm sure, you know, have viewed, because I'm only at the beginning of the research. But <coughs> nevertheless, I'm unveiling for you now this minute the first, very early suspension bridge with these incredibly elegant overlapping chains used by I.K. Brunel for his design on the suspension bridge, used by him to promote his design, first of all, to Telford and the people, the people that were judging, and then later to Davies, Giddy, or do I say Gilbert by this point? Gilbert. Yeah. Gilbert. He's using that feature of Maudsley's bridge to promote his design for the Clifton suspension bridge, and I'm longing to know if anybody else knows of any other suspension bridges by Maudsley, because it seems to me a sort of so unlikely. He's not a man for whom the words suspension bridge immediately leaps into your mind when you read his name. So any, anything, any ideas anybody has, I would be awfully interested to know. But as I say, I think you're the perfect audience to unveil my new and exciting discussion. Thank you.